Hello and welcome to Circle Time, the early years podcast. My name is Glenn Denny and my guest this week is the director and co-founder of Schema Play. Her early years journey began in maintained and Montessori nursery schools in London, where their passion for nurturing young minds was ignited. Now, in 2016, they embarked on a collaborative research project alongside Professor John Siraj Blackford. This work led to the birth of Schema Play, an initiative born out of their research and the transformative impact Schema Play was having in enhancing outcomes for young children. With a shared vision of fostering free flow play and empowering young learners, both of them created an awe-inspiring training program for early years educators. Welcome to Circle Time, Lynette Brock. Thank you very much, Glenn. It's great to be here. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. I was just saying before we started recording, like the bio you sent me and it was like, how do I how do I shorten that down so I have missed out a ton of your amazing <laughs> career? Um, so you started off in Montessori, I believe, I and, and maintained schools, wasn't it? Yeah, I did. That was my way in, really. I did a um, Montessori diploma, um, and that kind of got me into early years. And then I started to look at other philosophies, wanted to know a little bit more, started working in some maintained nurseries, because um, I wanted to get a good breadth of experience. And then I went on to to do the BA degree and on, on from there. And then I ended up lecturing <laughs> um, <laughs> um, on the BA um, and also the foundation degree. So it was really exciting. But I just, um, it wasn't that I can't stop learning. I was more intrigued to know more about really helping children to get what they want out of their journey and to make sure the experiences that they had were fruitful for them rather than just an offering. Yeah, and that's it. Because we were talking just before about how it it's about following the flow of the child, really, wasn't it? The, the kind of we have similar kind of beliefs there that it's following the flow of the child rather than here's what you're going to learn today. It's what what do you want to learn today, isn't it? It really is. And it's, I suppose uh, you'll be in agreement with this. It really starts with that continuous provision, doesn't it? Whether there's a provision there that enables children to explore independently, to find things in there that they're going to be able to achieve. They're going to be able to problem solve their way through it because they've got the anchors to be able to do so. So we've really seeded an amazing environment. And then it's about that sort of sensitively tuning in isn't it is there something more going on here what is capturing their attention and quite right as you say if they are in flow if they are fully immersed in play we definitely know there's something going on there for the child there's an exploration of some sort and it's it's that ability to really look into that and see how we can respond Oh, it absolutely is. Now, the, the tell me a bit more about this, the, the collaborative research project that you were doing. So this is where, of course, you now run Schema Play, the community interest company as well. It's I know I, I kind of missed half the title off there, but it's Schema Play kind of, it says a little bit about what it does, but obviously there's more to it than that. So where where was the genesis of this from? Okay, so um, we going wind back to sort of 2014-15, um initially we started some research um with kent local authority and we were looking at how we could um support sustainable citizenship so we started by looking at if we introduce schemes um the operations that children enjoy applying that many people might be familiar with such as containing and trajectory and transporting if they've got those anchors, something they can do, you know, the can do in the EYFS, if you like, something that they feel capable in doing, how could we nurture them into uh, being interested in sustainable citizenship, you know, um, interested in consumption, conservation, reduction? So we started our journey there. Then through conversations with another local authority up in Warsaw, they said, this sounds so exciting. We really want to know how it has an impact generally holistically to see what it's like for our learning outcomes um so we joined uh nicola and her team up there and we 
rolled it out across 12 earlier settings to see what impact it would have. Um, and it was lovely because when you start hearing things like he's a changed child, <laughs> his, his dad can't believe how confident he is, you know, all of that coming through, then you know that this learning is going to happen because that catalyst to learning confidence is coming through. Um, so really promoting mastery and that critical thinking and problem solving really spurred the practitioners on and then they could fine tune into the unique investigations. Oh, it's, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It was like we were, we were talking as well about schemes and, and that's kind of been part of my journey as well that, you know, you, you learn more about them because th there's a number of them, isn't there, of schemes? Yeah, I mean, in our whole training, we look at 37. <laughs> we start off with the sort of foundational schemes, you know, um, one that many people know about the trajectory scheme, which we often see with in babies initially, you know, they're, they're reaching, they're grasping, they're banging, um, but also very young children in their eye scanning, you know, initially they're watching the adults around them, mm -hmm. making sure that they're going to respond when they need them and they're reliable. And then once they know that adults responding, well, hey, I can now focus my attention on the objects around me, which is brilliant because actually how we learn about what things are, such as a bucket, is by what you can do with it. It's affordance. Um, so the fact that they're then tuning into the objects Excellent. They're also finding out about animals such as birds. You know, they fly in the air and cats walk along the ground and make a noise. Meow. <laughs> so they're really starting to pick up those early then. And of course, that tra trajectory investigation often then lends itself into jumping, throwing, running, rolling. And we find we've got explorations of things like up and down coming into our investigations you know we're fascinated by the water that drips from a guttering or things that go up in the air and then children might roll balls along ramps and then we might hear a statement like whoa that went a long way and then we know haha there's your inquiry how do we help a child to see just how far that goes so it's funny we when we actually look at these schemes we can actually see lots of learning holistically coming through definitely lots of scientific and mathematical explorations such as motion as things travel force as I have to push a wheel along to make it roll in a line mm -hmm. gravity as I'm dropping things height length distance and there we see then actually schemes are the prerequisites to absolutely everything we do in life and it's really intriguing to see how we're using them all day, every day as adults as well. Mm -hmm. it, it was funny, you, some of the examples you were giving there, and I was like, I kept thinking of um, the children in my own setting, and it's like, yeah, we have the guttering, we rolled the balls there. At one point, we used to have a really high tower. We, we quite often change our play area quite a bit, um, and it was it was interesting to sort of look at the the tower and we put the guttering down and we were rolling the balls and again it was it was the the wee and the look how fast it's going it's traveling really quickly and all that language was coming through and it it's funny that you don't sometimes you don't stop and actually relate actually that's a scheme but it's just part of everyday life as well isn't it yeah i mean children will be starting these patterns of behaviour, as they're often referred to, and we'll see them in lots of different ways in their play. And then when you see something like what you've just explained, you know, the guttering and you hear wee and you hear that, that's going fast, that's going slow, that's gone a long way. Of course, it's those often throwaway statements. That is an inquiry, if you like. And I wonder how often, because when I look back on my, you know, job how often did I actually respond to those and say oh yes it did go a long way you know let's see how far this one how often did I actually think how are we going to evaluate just how far long is and the exciting thing about children exploring a trajectory scheme is they often like lining things up mm -hmm. and if they can count where we've had a child that's gone wow that went a long way if they like lining things up, we could say, right, you know, you're really good at lining things up. Let's put these blocks in a line. Now let's have a look. You roll the ball. Let's see. Oh, right. Come on, let's see how far it went. We count the blocks. And whilst we're counting, the child's counting, we could be tallying. 
another way of exploring the trajectory scheme. And so then they're evaluating just how far it went. And if we put those ramps at different heights, whoa, we've got a really exciting exploration going on. That's the thing as well, isn't it? Because it's part, almost part of everyday life as well. You don't need anything special. There's, there's certain kind of... Um, I can't think of the word, but like certain kind of ways of development that require specific pieces of equipment and things like that. But this doesn't. This is just everyday life. So it doesn't, you know, for settings, this is perfect. It's perfect. You don't have to go buying expensive resources at all. We do need to give some thought to it, like in that case with the ramps, having them at different heights. Um, if you've got a child who's mad keen on containing, you know, the ones that fit everything um, and, you know, they're walking around with buckets and they're filling all sorts of things. And, and mum this week said to me, can you help me? She said, everything out of my kitchen keeps coming out of the cupboards. And when we explained, oh, you know, this is great. She's like, what? <laughs> but actually, you know, well, they're seeing everything in the cupboard, then everything out. That's a great exploration of capacity and volume. And we're seeing great space. And then we're seeing how it looks when it's out. So we're seeing different arrangements of things. They might be counting as they're putting them in. We don't know. We'd have to see. But in that case, you know, if we've got a great container, we need to think about have we got not just the containing opportunities like the buckets, the bags and so forth. What often gets missed is do we have groups of objects? Because the exciting thing about being a container might be to see how things fit and do not fit. It might be that we want to count things and we need different quantities of them. It might be the weight of things as we're walking around with them in our bucket. So we need to think, we do need to have a think about it. But no, we certainly don't need to go and buy a whole load of new resources. Okay. So that's a win-win. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's interesting you're saying that. So the, the setting that I'm at, we're outside all the time and we have hazel trees. Ironic because we're meant to be a nut-free nursery, but we actually have hazel trees in the garden. <laughs> Luckily, none of the children are allergic to hazelnuts. But um, we also have... Um, acorns as well and nearby the, there's pine cones and things like that so we bring those and it, like you say i mean we have different size buckets mostly for the sand or for the digging areas but the children then bring these along and they they end up everywhere which is fine this is what it's about they're exploring they're they're discovering but then they're filling them up and like some of the children are, are coming to me with handfuls as well look look how many i've got and again that's a container they filled their hand as well and I think sometimes as well for some practitioners it, it's interesting they've got to stop and think actually you don't need anything specific your hand is perfect for doing that sort of thing uh, you know rolling down a hill as well there's another different slope for you as well yeah I mean the outdoor environment is great isn't it because just thinking about a cross-section of schemes there um, you mentioned you know the cones the leaves and so forth a child with a trajectory scheme has got different ways of exploring lines. Um, if they're interested in seeing how many things fit from one place to another, which may come out of that trajectory scheme exploration initially of making lines, having the different you know, quantities around them quite naturally in the environment. They might explore how many leaves fit from one place to another, how many pine cones do. You said one of the child's children were counting how many they had in their hand. So if you can fit that many in your hand, how many do you, could you fit in the small bucket? And I wonder how many go in the big bucket. Um, the fact that you said you've got different size buckets. I mean, this is brilliant for a container. Different height tubes in water play, different size buckets in the, in in mud play that's helping their size perception they might notice differences in weight there's so much that can come from that so there is a little bit of that prior thought mm -hmm. um but you know like quite right as you say they will be getting so much and it's that tuning in what's going on in our environment that makes it so exciting so we can affirm and respond to them is that where a uh like the schema play of course you do the accreditation with it as well for settings and um, is that where sort of the training for practitioners comes in where you help them to understand and actually it's not anything special as such it's not you don't need to learn loads and loads this is actually what the children are doing and it's just recognition really isn't it or am I just oversimplifying it no uh initially um 
identifying schemes is our starting point and we start with six or seven to start with um they are progressive for example um you know a children who've applied a trajectory scheme making lines with things may well then go on to putting them in a pattern enclosing themselves doing something like that a child who's transporting has first had to follow a line trajectory scheme and contain mm -hmm. so transporting is more sophisticated and we go on and we have schemes like matching sorting grouping tallying recording they're all schemes they're all doing things um so initially we get them just observing schemes then we look at and that's in their self-chosen free play then we look at okay so this is the scheme this is the pattern of behavior they're really wanting to explore how do we support their mastery their mastery behavior how do we help their self-knowledge about themselves what they can do and how do we help them to critically think and problem solve so what we look at initially is nurturing what we call it seeding the free flow play environment so how can that child, as they go from place to place, maybe thinking about arts, block play, water play, what accessibility into those plays have they got from their current scheme patterns of interest? Um, and then once we see children becoming masterful, we're looking more carefully, how are they exploring this? Because they've got the scheme capabilities to to do the things that we've seeded we're out of the picture as adults mm -hmm. we let them make the choice the decision and what they're doing they're critically thinking they're problem solving and they often shout out hey mrs lynette come and look at this i've done it that self-knowledge coming back there and that's what i found really made an impact in in our work in warsaw the children were problem solving they mm -hmm. were actually independently problem solving we're tuning in then, we're looking, we're listening. Like you said, the words, that's fast, that's slow. Okay, that's about speed or that went a long way. That's about length or distance. Mm -hmm. We're tuning in and we're then thinking about, okay, having that meeting of minds, which um, uh, Kathy Silva, Iram Siraj and, and colleagues call Sustained Edge thinking that, okay, there's an evaluation to be have here. How high, how long? And sometimes there's an investigation going on and you just need to step into the play to model something just briefly mm -hmm. enough to give that play a bit of a spin for them to fly forward with it. So it's all about being pretty sensitive and affirming and responding. So through the seeding, just the nurturing of the free flow play environment, we're saying to the child, have you had a look? We've we've got this out here and this is here and these are going to be here all the time. Letting them know they're there. Because we might say something like, we've seen you love filling boxes. Have you seen this? And it might be nesting dolls or nesting boxes. So what we're doing is we're supporting that size relation. Mm -hmm. It might be having different bowls in the role play and, and having Goldilocks and the three bears as a story. So it's thinking about how we sort of put, pull it together for the child so that what they're line of inquiry is, if you like, we're facilitating and we're responding to. I know it, it's that bit as well, isn't it? Where we're kind of looking at their, um, their kind of what they're doing, but we're not interfering. It, it's that careful balance, isn't it? Where we're kind of watching, being brought in when almost when we're invited, really, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. Or if there's a bit where we, we feel like, again, it's knowing our children as well. And if we know that they're struggling, we can see that they're struggling. It's like going in and giving that that little suggestion, but being so careful not to take over as well. And that's super important, isn't it? It really is. I'm, I'm so glad you're on this same wavelength. I, absolutely. Um, one of the things that when we've often gone out to work and, and support nurseries, we've noticed that adults are almost frightened to let the children be playing independently. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong there is a time for co-playing and and mm -hmm. supporting that play but if we are with the children all the time even if we think we're following a child's lead the chances are we're not because we're we're all the time thinking where the play could go and we might take it try to take it off in a direction that is not the direction actually that they want to go in um and we have to be very mindful of that and the stepping in and out 
out of play is really hard. It takes time. It's it 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 takes time to really get to grips with. But stepping back enables children to get into flow. Um, and as Cheek Semihai in his research recognised, it is only when children are in flow that learning and creativity is actually taking place. So that gets us to be very mindful here. I wouldn't say we're lollipop people, or, but we are sort of facilitators because what we're doing is we're seeing where the play is going, being very mindful and then making sure our response is is a fruitful response for that child. It's going to really ignite them and get them excited, but maintain their control. And when we do offer a new activity, a provocation, this meeting of minds, we are always anchoring the scheme and tend to invite the children into it by saying, Harry, I know you're really good at making lines, for example. Today, I need to try and find out how many things we need to go from one place to another, if that's where we think the children are. Recently, I had a, 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 a little girl who was lining things up in a nursery and the teacher said to me, I think she likes vehicles. And I said, all right. And she said, yep, so I'm going to do a role play, um, car wash. I'm going to read stories stuck in the muck and da, 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 da. And went along the line of the interest. Then she realized the little girl wasn't responding to anything. And then she did the training and she said, she's making a line. And she said, that's the trajectory scheme. And she said, we don't have any big groups of objects. And the reason why she's using the vehicles is that is the only thing that we've got that she can make lines with. And when she spoke to mum and dad about this, they were trying to think about what they've seen at home. And dad said the most interesting thing for him was whenever he cut the grass, his daughter was getting some little stones from around their patio. They kind of around the edge of their patio and was taking them from one fence to another and lining them up. And mum said, yes, and she's counting to 24. And the educator said, I have not heard her counting. And so, of course, that meant she could go into looking at distance and how many between two different points and and taking the play forward. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, it, it it's interesting that bit, like when you were talking about the practitioner there, how before the training she was looking at one thing, but then with the understanding and that knowledge, and that, that just shows how important knowledge and, and continuing professional development is, that actually she went, wait a minute, I've got that wrong it's it's not that she wasn't trying to support the child but and that's important to emphasize but it was maybe not the right element that she was looking at and like she opened her eyes and she saw what it was that's just so amazing I think for me that um the big light bulb moment when she's when she sort of had her light bulb moment as well was they are an empowering tool to our work to be able to identify schemes. I mean, Chris Athey's research with Tina Bruce, of course, demonstrated that. Kathy Nutbrand's written extensively on it. Uh, you know, um, Kath Arnold, too, following her granddaughter and so forth. So we've got quite a lot of research. And of course, if we think about it in terms of the EYFS, schemes are showing us the can do, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They're operational. So they're, they're doing capabilities. Um, and it also stops us from thinking children are flitting because if we actually are aware of schemes, they might be flitting because there's nothing enough to get them immersed. And so once we're aware and we can spot them, we can now be thinking, OK, how can we really help the holistic development, mm -hmm. open up a breadth of curriculum explorations for this child from what their patterns of behaviour interests are? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's really important as well. You you were saying that um, by understanding that and and yeah, children do they do flip like you say that is the perfect description. Children do flip from one thing to the other, and it was interesting. Like um, I, I was late leaving work today because I was helping some of my colleagues to completely tidy up the playroom. So we have an indoor play space, and it's got lots and lots of baskets. You you can tell what happens there with all these baskets. Now I spent time over the the holidays tidying them up, and I labelled them all and. 
knowing full well i've been in this game long enough to know fine that not everything is going to end up in the same basket and sure enough it didn't but it just shows that that flitting between um the different things and doing different things there's there's so much going on and it's just tuning in isn't it yeah i also think it's funny that you should say that because one of the the things that i found that really helps uh, practitioners is sometimes what they feel is slightly challenging behavior where it's maybe upsetting their other peers you know they're getting a basket and throwing once we're aware what is it the child really wants to do here we can then you know motivate that enable that empower them in a in a way where they're going to be able to you know see what things look like as they travel through the air how do they work you know we can really support support that um and that emptying you know just emptying them all onto the floor well you know from the moment we're born we're put inside a high chair inside a car seat in a cot in one room taken mm. out of a room put in a car so this this inside outside and the barrier between the two as soon as we are physically capable we really want to explore this mm -hmm. so for young children coming into the nursery for the first time, they may not have had this amazing situation where I've got all these baskets and I can go along and empty them. Mm -hmm. And of course, it is an exploration literally of inside and outside. And it's no coincidence that there's a lot of stories that are about in and out, mm -hmm. you know, and we've got um, things like uh, there was an old lady who swallowed a fly and in it in the little props oh, yeah. go into the tummy all of that and and that's another interesting thing is that children attach words to their operational schemes mm -hmm. um there's a researcher called lakoff and his colleagues who have found that language stems from our operational schemes um and it's our first and enduring language so if a child has a trajectory scheme and likes up and down the chances are even if they're not verbalizing it, they might know the words up and down. Mm -hmm. And if a child's containing, they might know in and out. So one of the other things that we really um, work towards um, improving is thinking about our stories and our rhyme offering. How do they link to children's schemes so that, A, they can play out their scheme during the story, so they're participating. Mm -hmm. There'll be already probably foundational language in that story that they already recognize. So the rest is more graspable and they're going to enjoy it more. So we're getting that joy of literacy. We're inviting them into the literacy club, which mm -hmm. for children who don't have books and stories and rhymes going on at home, having that anchor in makes that that zone of proximal development, that challenge a little bit more within reach because they feel, oh yeah, I don't mind containing something. We're doing gold looks on the three bears. I'll fill the porridge. Mm -hmm. And and so it becomes a little bit more exciting for them as well. It is. Yeah. I I mean I for me, I I I love the idea of schemes going on. And to me, it, it's one of the foundational things of, of children's development. You know, I've worked with babies as well. I've worked from, you know, right the way through into the after school club and even then there's still schemes going on there you, like you, you can see experimentation going on where they'll, they'll they'll take a ball and they'll throw it across the playing field but babies as well like being in the high chair like they're contained in the high chair and they will they'll take their spoon and they'll go and they'll bang it to see what it sounds like and what it feels like and tasting it and then they'll drop it as well it's that dropping bit and you think you know my goodness, how many times are you going to do that? Well, as many times as it takes till they've actually decided what what they're getting from it. Yeah, and what a great investigation because it depends on the drop. But, you know, am I leaning over the high chair? Am I interested in the point of departure to the point of arrival? Yes, it's as complex as that. They are interested in how it leaves them and where it goes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it's this way, <laughs> is it the distance? Mm -hmm. How far can I get this? And does it squash when it lands? Does it bounce when it lands? And what a great early exploration of gravity. So <laughs> it can be frustrating being a mum when you want the food to go in the mouth rather than everywhere. But it is absolutely great learning for a child. And of course, they are in control. And that's that's 
where learning is happening when a child feels that they have got this control in it that's when the confidence comes so yeah I I love I love the high chair uh, play and and you know having dropping platforms and so forth but you're right schemes become more sophisticated they don't go away Mm -hmm. Um, and so we will see them right the way through Um, something I sometimes say is you know have you ever thought about the schemes that you use when you make an omelette? You know, I've never stopped to think about that. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's it's something as simple as that. Cooking our meal, what do we do? We often pour trajectory um, out of a container. So we've filled a container. We might whisk an egg. We're rotating. And then we pour it into other containers to serve. And then we transport it, don't we, to a table or somewhere. And and then, you know, we might be having some positioning on there because we might make a fancy pattern with mushrooms and so forth. So they don't go away. They just get more and more sophisticated. And, and what happens, and this is what we do uh, do in our level two training, is we start to support how we facilitate children who are showing a few schemes to start combining them. So they get mastery in that combining of schemes because what happens is we learn to combine schemes and later they get, we call it clustering, they get chunked. Mm -hmm. And those chunk schemes are in complex operations. So, for example, we've got a whole cluster of schemes that we draw upon when we make an omelette. But we've also got a whole cluster of schemes that we draw upon when we go to add up, write a shopping list measure something um so yeah schemes are prerequisites to absolutely everything we do in life so when we think about it like that we really do want to empower and we really do want to support children in that free flow play to problem solve use of schemes in a variety of different ways i feel quite passionate about this now because we have no idea what the jobs of tomorrow are going to be Mm -hmm. Absolutely no idea, but we do need critical, creative, problem-solving, independent thinkers. So that nurturing that critical thinking and problem-solving, giving activities that have the child has the scheme to use them. So if you like, in free flow play, they're supporting, they're self-scaffolding their own ZPD. They've got the scheme anchors and they're problem-solving their way to find their potential in using it. Just like we do when we come in to do an adult guided activity to extend the play forward, we're always making sure that we, it's a challenge within their reach. But if we seed a really good free flow play environment, we can really support and promote great self scaffolding as well. Goodness, yeah. I'm I'm still blown away by the your analogy with the omelet, and I'm like, oh my word! I never even it never even occurred to me that as an adult I still use schemes. It's like, yes, I do. Oh my word! Yeah, I mean, I you always think about it in terms of childhood, but actually, yeah, it it continues all the way through life. Those early experiences, those early experiments that we do, and it, I'm, I'm, I feel happy calling it an experiment because that's what we're doing. We're experimenting and we're trying. And that really does, it does build through and cement within you and all the way through your life. Yeah, when we're writing, we draw lines, trajectory. Mm -hmm. When we are exploring an enclosing containing scheme graphically, which usually comes after we've had lots of explorations of using our whole body, we later refine that exploration, that pattern of behaviour interest into graphic and we start to see those wobbly shapes. You know, they look a bit like jellies and they might put a dot in the middle or something like that. Well, if we think about the letter O, A, C, O, A, half, C, mm-hmm. bottom of the B, they're an enclosed space. So, you know, we can start to shapes, triangles, circles, square. It's all coming from that containing a closing scheme, but now being in a graphic exploration so that's why when we're seeding say for a container we'd be thinking about containing opportunities but we'd be thinking also you know holistically music how are they able to contain and explore percussion beat and so forth how can they contain and explore arts and crafts Mm -hmm. um you know we might have transient art in a frame or we might be mixing colors in a bowl so we're 
we're, we're finding lots of ways for them to explore that, that scheme as well as following their unique inquiry, that investigation that we might have overheard, seen. Um, children who are verbalising, it's great, isn't it, when they say something like, whoa, Mrs Netty, as I often get called, that went such a long way. And you're like, yeah, but uh, how long? Let's have a look at that. Or, or, you know, we might see the child is just fascinated by the downness and you think, right, down is really important, gravity dropping. How mm. are we going to go with that? So verbalising or just really watching what they're intently exploring, we've got lots of great ways to go forward. And it's such a positive way of working with colleagues. You know, we're nudging each other. What do you think? What do you think is going on? <laughs> Absolutely. So, Lynette, if people are wanting to get in touch with you to find out more about um, Schema Play, um, how do they do that? Where, where can they find you? Um, well, please do visit uh, www.schemaplay.com. Um, we have online training. We also visit settings, um, work with trusts, um, still engage in research for, for some companies as well. Um, and we also have um, special days going on, like we've got an event on the 16th of March in Essex, which is a great introduction into Schema Play, and it would enable people to think about whether they want to go on and do the accreditation. Most importantly, all these introductions mean they can just run with it on the Monday morning when they get back into the setting and start to use it in practice. And I think for me, that that's the most humbling thing about this work is I, I love it when they come back and say, oh, my word, I never looked at it like this. And I am so going to let the child know that I find what they're doing interesting and respond. Mm -hmm. Because if we can, uh, Kathy Nutbrown wrote about this extensively, this respectful uh, educators, capable learners, that respect, showing the child that we are fascinated in them and want to know them is so important. Yeah. Um, and by all means, email me. Thank you for that. Admin at schemaplay.com. I'd love to hear from anybody who's interested in engaging in schema play. Oh, it's absolutely wonderful. Lynette, thank you so much for this. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I think I'm going to go off and make an omelette now. <laughs> 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 Lynette Brock, thank you so much for being part of Circle Time. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. <laughs>